morning and welcome to the Cornerstone Church Tradition Service. We're just so blessed to be able to worship with you this morning. We've had some rain this weekend. And can we just say we really miss worshiping with you face to face, but we are so blessed to be able to uh, come together and at least stream together. Maybe some face to face next week. Maybe. 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 All right, let's worship together.
Father, we need you so much. We need you in the good and in the bad. We need you in the days of sunshine and the days of rain. And we are so grateful that you hear our cry. You know our needs. And you willingly and happily are here with us by our side, working in us, protecting us, healing us, uh, being our companion and friend when we feel alone, um, doing all the things that we need from you. God, you are mighty, you are powerful, and you are also personal. So Lord, we just lift up Pastor Chris to you right now as he prepares the word to bring to you. Lord, open our hearts to hear what it is that you would have to say to us and keep our minds just on you throughout all of this worship and all that we do. In your holy and heavenly name, we pray these things. Amen. Cornerstone, I want you to know that no matter what happens in the elections, no matter what happens in this world, God's love is faithful and it's new every morning. We're going to wake up and we're going to find out that God is sovereign, Jesus is still working, and that he calls us to be his church. Now, today I want to talk to you uh, about why on earth we're here. We're in the middle of our spiritual drive. It's, uh, we're calling it uh, Stronger Together, that it's a 40-day of community. We're being involved in life groups and uh, growing together. And, and, and this is the basic idea, that God wants everyone to go to heaven. He wants you to know and him and to grow in his character. Uh, he wants you to grow spir spiritually. And so that's what we're going to look at today is how do we grow spiritually? Uh, how is it that God has designed us uh, better together in this community to grow spiritually? And because the Bible teaches that you cannot grow spiritually on your own, the Bible actually teaches that you have to have other people around you. And that's why we are encouraging everyone to be in a life group. We have over 100 people right now going through our series of 40 days together in a life group. And if you're not in one, I hope you will pray and, and get connected into the church life here. Today, uh, we're going to look at something very important in your Bibles. If you would, turn over to Daniel chapter 6. And I want to focus in on one verse here. Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. And as we're going through this series, I'm praying that, uh, that there, there would be a response of God's people to the seriousness of what's going on in our world. How do we respond as God's people? And, and so I, I want to encourage you through the book of Daniel. If you haven't read it, maybe uh, this week and this week you could just open up the book of Daniel and read through it. I'll give you a little bit of a, a background here. It's just 12 short chapters. Daniel is taking... Uh, into captivity from his homeland and into the Babylonians. He's captive. And Daniel, even in a culture that wasn't his own, even in a culture that was difficult and strange, he thrived. And how do we do that? And, and it says this in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. This is God's word to us this morning. Now, Daniel, in the midst of all of the chaos of the culture, in the midst of the world that was so strange to him as he was in the Babylonians, uh, he says this, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by the, his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole world. It says in verse 3, Daniel so distinguished himself. Uh, maybe he wasn't distinguished, but he decided that he was going to be distinguished by how his character stood out. He decided to live like nobody else. He decided uh, that he was going to follow uh, God's rules and not the man's rules. He decided he wanted to do something with his life that would stand out. Not just go through the, the, the motions and go with the flow. Not, not just to agree with the culture, but to go deeper with what his faith said he should be. He decided to be different from everybody else. And he didn't shy away from living his biblical values, but he pressed into them. In light of the overwhelming pressures that he found himself in the culture around him, he retained his convictions, even when he was scorned, uh, e even when uh, in, in endangered times, uh, he fell back into his faith. And because the way that he lived, he was, he was seen as distinguished. Uh, he distinguished himself in the sight of those who were in the leadership and in, in, in the sight of the kingdom, the whole, the whole land. And what I want to look at today is I want to look at 
this fourfold cycle that's twice, twice repeated in the book of Daniel. We see that, number one, he, he had the pressure to conform. And then second, he faced danger and scorn when he stood out because of his biblical faith. And he steps up, number three, he steps up and he, he helps his captors in spite of the way that they're being treated. The Babylonians, the way he was treated. And finally, he gains distinguished and he's influenced and he has appreciation as a result of his faith. Here's what I want us to learn about this passage. It was because the people saw Daniel was a follower of Yahweh. That there was something different about him and, and his efforts and his ideology. And, and, and because of that, it stood out. Uh, does your faith stand out, Cornerstone? Is there something about you that is different from uh, everyday life around you? The, the biblical model that we see is this. It's one of redemption. We're on a mission uh, to make each other better. The biblical model, that, that's what God is calling us in, in a hurting and dying world. That's why he calls us to be this type of church that's inside out. That what we believe on the inside starts being poured out on the outside in our community. And think about this, the Bible says that Daniel so distinguished himself with exceptional qualities. I, I, I want to pause right there. And, and if you take this verse and you put it into practice, it doesn't just make your, your experience on Sunday great, but it makes your whole life great. It, it gives you a great home life. It, it gives you a sense of values where you work. If you distinguish yourself and have these exceptional qualities... Um, look what happens. It says that the king decided to put Daniel in charge of the whole country. Uh, he, here's this week's theme for our Stronger Together 40 Days of Community. We make each other better. We make each other better. Uh, let me tell you why this is important for our church. If, if you're like most of us, you grew up in a church where the pastor had a dream. He had an idea. He had some type of vision. And, and, he, and he spent the, the rest of the time of the church raising money to live out the pastor's idea of what the vision, what the dream should be. We spent time recruiting volunteers into the ministries of the pastor. And this idea is a, that, that, that the pastor has, has the, the, the elevation, he has the dreams, he has the values, he has the vision. But very few people encounter a church that says, uh, man, they empower me. Church makes me better. No one ever talks about the dreams that are at my heart. We always do something somebody else wants to do, what the pastor wants to do. And a lot of this is just human behavior that stems from how the church began. And we see this in the biblical Old Testament. Let me give you a little history lesson here. When God set up uh, the new kingdom, he taps into a new group of people. He taps them on the shoulders and, and, and he wants to work through them. It's the Israelites. He chooses a specific group. And he says this, the third born son of the leader of God chosen from Israel... The third born son was a, name, a man named Levites. And the Bible calls them Levites. They were chosen in the lineage to be the priests of God's people. And so in the Old Testament, they were the only ones who would have the exclusive right, the special ability to spend time with God. They were the chosen ones, the priests. And so this is how it worked. If you committed some type of sin, then what you had to do is go to the priests. You had to go to the Levites, and you had to, uh, you had to, to, to confess to them. And they would go to God on your behalf. They would mediate for you, and they would sacrifice, a blood sacrifice offering for the sinfulness of of your life or your family. And all of God's people were waiting in this courtyard, waiting on the Levites, the priests, and they would go speak to God and deliver the message that God gave to the people. Well, God used these things in the Old Testament to be an example. It was setting up a, a new story. He says this. He says that when I established the Israelites, it was the plan to reach all the nations. That God would be known, not just within the Israelite nation, but through all nations. And he was going to use this covenant, this promise that he gave to God's people, the Israelites. And he would give a new covenant, a new testament. And so Jesus arrives on the scene and he mixes it all up. He's, he's not wearing a, a priestly robe with special tassels. He, he has no reserved parking spot. 
uh, at the, the front of the temple. There's no pomp or circumstance. He just shows up. He starts working with the common people. And, and have you noticed that the religious people didn't care much for Jesus? Uh, with all the rules of the temple and all the law, the common folk, though, loved Jesus. Um, Jesus comes along and he says, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the law and all those things in the Old Testament that God was using in this sovereign plan to set up for this new covenant when Jesus fulfills them. He says, we no longer need to go through the religious circumstances that we had in the Old Testament. And Jesus says this on the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. He says, you have heard that said that people from long ago, you shall not murder And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, now listen, he says, he switches it. He says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister is a subject of judgment. Jesus says, I've set up the law to show you that you can, can perform at a certain level and nothing you can do can prove yourself worthy until you have a heavenly transaction. You need help. And Jesus says something that really freaks them out. He says, my father wants to talk to you directly. Not through someone else, not through a mediator. He wants to talk to you directly. And he wants wants to have this relationship with you. And he said to these common folk, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. I, I want to do some great things in and through you, not just through the priests. And no one had heard this before. This was a, 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 a new gospel. A new story. And he backs it up and he, he does this on the day of Pentecost, which is the birthplace of the church in Acts chapter 2. And, and, and this unique thing happened. God pours out his spirit, not just on the few, but on everybody. The Holy Spirit descends on them. Not, not, now everyone has direct access to God. God is working through all the people and the gifts of the Holy Spirit fall on everyone, not just on the 12 disciples, not just on a few but on everyone. And it went so far that it didn't just stop on the Jews. It says the Holy Spirit rested on the Gentiles as well. They they realized that God no longer was working on just a few select people called priests anymore. And and after all this ended, the people, they, they experienced this empowering of God in their own life that God wanted to work through them to change the world, that all would know who, who he was. And after all of this happens, guess what? They go right back to their old systems. And they even hire a few people to do the gospel work. They call them clergy. A word that's not even in the Old Testament or the New Testament. We use this word all all the time. A clergyman, a priest, a pope, a pastor, a leader. You're the man with the special ability. Uh, You can pray. You have the special ability that that, that your prayers matter and everyone else's um, just have to go through you. Come pray for me. Or pray for my mother or pray for my children. Because my prayers don't matter. Your prayers matter, pastor and clergyman. And you look at this word clergy, it actually donates uh, that the, 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 the clergyman is some type of expert. And everyone else is a commoner. Uh, and they devised another word for the common man. They, they came up a word that's not even in the Bible. They call it the laity or the layman. You're the novice. You really don't know your stuff. You come to me, and I'll tell you what to know. And so everything has to go through the mediator, just like the Old Testament priests. And even the word clergy came to denote the word clerk, someone who reads, uh, someone who, who understands what the Bible means. The priest would come and read the Holy Bible, and, and we wouldn't want the common person to mess it up. So only the priest can read the Bible. And the people come to say, okay. Whatever you say, pastor, I'll be back next week, and you pray for me, and you read the Bible for me, and you tell me what it means. Nothing in the Bible supports this, nothing, and yet we keep going through this tradition until in the 1500s, some people started reading their Bibles, and they said, you know, this isn't right. I don't read it here anywhere. And the Protestant Reformation, the protested Reformation, the movement begins. One of the key ideas of the Protestant Reformation, the priesthood of all is the priesthood of all believers. That there's not layers, that there's not a clergy and a professional level, and then there's a layman down here, not a priest and a commoner. We all are priests in God's eyes. We can go directly to God. But check this out. They preach that, 
but nothing changes. And after the Great Reformation, here we are 2,000 years later, and I'm called the preacher. And, and look over there, there's the preacher. Well, guess what? I ain't the preacher. I'm your pastor. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm your tour guide. I, I'm here not to run the church. That's everyone's job. And everyone is, needs to, to step up to this. We've done this completely backwards from what the Bible says. And, and the congregation le- is, is leading. Uh, the congregation is making the decision. And the pastor is doing all the ministry. And the Bible actually says it needs to be the other way around. That God calls the pastor to be the shepherd. To lead his people. And the people are called to minister. And that's what needs to happen here. That the people have to give up the leadership and begin to minister. And the pastor needs to give up the ministry and just lead to be a tour guide. That's that's the Acts New Testament church. That's the type of church that we want to be here, Cornerstone. So Lynn and I are sitting in a living room about 15 years ago, and we're launching this church, Cornerstone, and we start sharing the ministry with them, and we start think, and they start saying things like this. Well, pastor, what do you want me to do? Because they grew up in churches where the reverend, the holy man, uh, was the one who told them what to do. And, and I said, you know, there's no special people here. Um, this is, church is just like a Home Depot. It has concrete walls, right? There's nothing holy about this church because the church is the people. And, and, and someone comes to church and says, where's the cross? I don't see the cross on the outside of the building. Where's the cross at? And I say to him, well, the, 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 this building's not holy because you're the holy one. You are the building of Christ. You're the temple of Christ, who, who the Holy Spirit who lives in you. The building is not the church. Who's the church? This is not a holy place. You are the holy place. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. And so we've mixed this all up. We have it backwards and upside down. And I start telling this group, if we do it right, then the best ministry of the church shouldn't be doing, going through me as the pastor, but the, but the best ministry of the church should go through everyone. That's the church being the church. That's the church. When it doesn't need the pastor to do ministry, it, 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 it just looks like God's people. We need to believe in the people that... That God's going to work through you to do the ministry. And my job is just to take you on a little tour. And to read the scriptures and to show you how you can do the ministry that God has prepared for you. The, 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 the purpose for your life. And we got to get back to it and say, okay, pastor, just tell us. What do you want us to do? And I'll just say, it's your ministry. You do the ministry. You see how that works. And. Uh, I went out with a group of guys to the lake in August, and it was hot, and it was kind of humid, you know, the monsoon weather that we have, and, and, and the guy said, okay, pastor, it's, it's your turn, to, pre- it's your turn to, to, to pray for us, and I said, wait a minute, like it's not my job to do the, to do the ministry, it's your job, I, I'm just a salesman, right, so I just tell people about Jesus we got to get this idea, this understanding that to so distinguish yourself is to live with such values that it's not somebody else's job, but it's your job to do the ministry, to distinguish yourself with biblical values. And so here's the deal, and, and this is so important to me. I, I want to pastor a church that what we believe makes a difference in how we live, that the people feel empowered, that God can do great things through you. And I, I really want you to know this, that Sundays can make you better, but God wants you to live this through the week as well. So why are we stuck spiritually in our lives? Uh, most people don't like church, uh, and they don't like God all that much because they have an incorrect view of both of them. Because how are you to view something that, that you really don't have a relationship with? If you have an incorrect view of God, then you're not going to like God very much, Right? And if you have an incorrect view of God's people, the church, then you're not going to like church very much. This is what Proverbs 23 says. It says, for as a man thinks, so his heart is. So even Jesus had this issue. He had this message, and no one gets it. 
No one gets it until Mark 8. Jesus asks this question. He says, Jesus and the disciples went on the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on their way, he asked them, who do the people say that I am? Like, what's the report around here? Uh, what are they saying about me? And just like today, they got it all wrong. They said, they replied, some say John the Baptist because John the Baptist's head was just cut off. And so maybe this is Jesus, re- you know, ba- John the Baptist reincarnated as Jesus. And others say Elijah because in the Bible, Elijah was so loved by God that he went straight to heaven and he never died. So maybe Jesus is Elijah and they don't get it. And still others say that you're prophets. And then Jesus asks them this question. I, I think he asks you and me the same question. What about you? Like, who do you say that I am? What are you saying about this? Because your view of church and your view of God will determine if this works for you or not. I I, want to make sure that you have a healthy view of who God is. Do you understand who God is? This is what I know. You cannot be empowered in your faith and life with this wrong view. And then verse 29, it says, but what about you, Jesus asks? Who do you say that I am? And Peter says this, he says, you are the Messiah, the Lord. I have nowhere else to go but through you. And so we have these wrong views of who God is. Uh, I'm going to put these on the screen. Number one, many people view God and church as a locked gate. Uh, in other words, there's, there's only one way in. It's exclusive. And those who have the key can get in. And so some even see me and say, you know, Chris, Pastor Chris, uh, you're just the seminary guy. You're the ordained guy. You're special. You have the inside scoop. Like somehow I'm holding on to the key to get through the door, and nobody else, because it's locked, can get through. And then there's the second incorrect view that comes from people's thinking about who God uh, is, and that somehow that they have all this luggage that comes with them. And they say this, Pastor, you don't know me. But if you really understood me, you would understand, uh, you would understand that, that God would never accept me. The, he might accept you because you're in the club. You have it all together, but, but not me. I, I don't have anything. And it's this incorrect view that we're disqualified from going through the door because somehow something in my past disqualifies me from having a relationship with God. I remember there was a woman who came to church, and after church she comes to me, and she's in tears, and she said, you know, Jesus has changed my life, but don't worry, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you. I won't get involved in anything at the church. I, I don't want to embarrass you with that. And she kind of hung, hung her, her head low, and I said, on contraire, <laughs> like, you're exactly who God wants to be in church. I actually know that God wants to do great things in and through your life. Really. I know with such certainty that God intentionally used the people who were the worst in the Bible. I mean, you can look at Moses. Moses was a murderer. You can look at King David. He was an adulterer. You can look at the disciples. There was one disciple, Matthew, who was a tax collector. And Jesus didn't just pick the priest. He went to these guys' house. Remember, he went to Zacchaeus' house, the tax collector, and he said, "Um, you're still stealing money from the people, but I want you to be on my team. I I, I mean, Jesus went after people who were sinful, who were broken, who were bent. And he says, you're the type of people I want to have a relationship with. I, I mean, look at Paul, the master teacher of the New Testament, the church planter, He was actually en route to the execution of Christians when Jesus comes to him. And and, and he doesn't have a perfect past. And and Jesus comes to him and he says, I I want you to follow me. I want you to write two-thirds of the New Testament with all of that mess, with all of that brokenness in your life. Why? Uh, I mean, why why does God do this? Because God doesn't care about your luggage. He wants to set you free. In fact, he says, in your weakness is where you're going to find my strength complete in you. He says, I want to set you free from it. I, I, I want you to do great things in your life and let go of your baggage and your luggage. And here's a third wrong pic- picture. If I'm going to do something significant in this world, 
then somehow I have to get on this endless ladder and start climbing that never that never ends. It's like there's 800 classes that you have to go to and you have to memorize all of this information. There's all these things that I need to say right, I need to give and become, and, and before I can do the right thing, I have to pass all of these courses. There's always one more class, one more qualification. The ladder just continues to go and it never ends, and, and we see God as one who, who will let you in if you work for it, if you accomplish enough. And so we never feel like we quite arrive. Have you been there? Do you know what I'm talking about? And I'm not just telling you this because this is actually what the Bible says. Um, we have a growth class, and there's only two classes that you have to go to. The first one just tells about what where church is all about. We just kick the tires and say, here's our mission. Here's what it means to follow Jesus. Here's what it means to share your story with somebody. It's just one class. And if you want to go to that and find out more about Cornerstone, it's going to be uh, Sunday. You're going to have it on Zoom. You can RSVP and find out more about this. Uh, there's no special classes that you have to take. You can just come in and discover for yourself where God wants to use you, what your purpose is. We don't have any special qualifications or time frames before you do anything around here except for this. When God is ready... He's going to move in your life in a fresh way, and he's going to tap you on the shoulder. And he's, he's going to rest his grace upon you. I always dream of a church that made room for everyone, whether this is your church home or whether you fly into this place from 3,000 miles away, whether you're watching from Canada or the other side of the United States or in our church backyard. This is what it means. It means to come to church and just breathe. Just be here with God and, 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 and be in this relationship. I'm so desperate to get away from the incorrect views of God and church. And so the last one is the real picture, the biblical picture that we're given, the picture of God in the church. In fact, it's such a picture of God in the church that, that everything that God gives us is delivered with this word attached to it. Whether it be salvation, whether it talks, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit or any potential purpose of your life, your ability, your destiny, it's a free gift. And the word is, it's, it's grace. It's, it's a free gift. It's, you don't have to pay for it. And, and you really do deserve it because God loves you. He just decided to surprise you with a free gift. My birthday just went by in October, October 22nd. And I was given a gift, a free gift. It was a puppy dog. And it was a free gift. And I received this. And the great thing about this gift is it, kept, it keeps on loving me. It just, it just does. And that's what God does. It's a free gift. It's undeserved. And probably one of the biggest misconceptions of faith is that somehow you have to earn it. So let me just tell you right now. The Bible never says you have to earn this gift. It's a gift that God gives you because of his love for you. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says it this way, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift. It's a surprise. It's, it's something that he just wants to lavish you with. It's a free gift from God, not by works, so that you can boast about it. Look what I did. Look what I can do. It's just a gift. And so look me in the eye. I just want you to hear this. My prayer is that, that you would get past the incorrect views of God and of church, whatever your past was, whatever you see God as, and realize that he wants to do something incredible in your life. This is what it says in Acts chapter 10. It says it best. It says, God's own truth, nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and, and you're ready to do it, as he says... There isn't a locked gate. There isn't a pile of luggage. There isn't some endless ladder that you have to climb. The door is open. And I'm personally inviting you to come in and make a difference. That it would be a distinguishing factor in your life. That it would set you apart from everybody else. Because you understand God's love for you. It's a free gift for you. And so let's go change the world together. It's simply that. That God's purpose is that everyone in this world would know his love. And the way he does it, it's plan A and there's no plan B. It's through you and through me. And, and I just want us to have a church that makes you better. Amen?
This is a huge value of, of, of this church. Uh, this, is, this is at the top of the list. The best ministry of this church happens not through me, but through you, through the entire church. Let me give you an example of this. When we started Cornerstone, I was sitting uh, and resting actually at another church before we began our own worship here at Cornerstone. My, my, my wife comes to me and she says, there's this guy that has a dream and is so similar to you, Pat, Chris. His name is Todd McCarran. And so I get together with Todd and I ask him what his dream is. And his dream is, is I want to make a difference in kids' life in the East Valley, the poorest of the poor, in a generation of kids in this valley. And I said, well, how do you want to do that? And he says, I want to send kids to camp. I said, well, where are you going to get the money to send kids to camp? He says, well, I want to start a self-funding ministry that exists simply to send kids to camp so that they can know Jesus. I said, that's a crazy, a crazy vision that God wants to use you to, to, to touch a whole generation. But guess what, Todd? I just spoke to a guy who has a vision that's very similar to yours. He says he wants to help fund a mission to help kids in the East Valley. And I say, maybe God put him in my life so that I could be put in your life and that I could help you to fulfill the purpose, the dream that God has given you to, to reach a generation of kids. And so we put the two guys together, and I went to Kent Shodin was his name. And I said, Kent, to start this ministry, it's going to take $75,000. And he said, thank you very much, but that's not my ministry. <laughs> And I said, well, I, I just want to thank you for helping us to think missionally, bigger than ourselves, that God would do something great among us. And I shook his hand. I said goodbye. And the very next day, I get a call from our treasurer, Bob Wilmoth. And Bob says, where did this $75,000 come from? And we started our ministry to reaching a generation of kids. And right now, we've sent over 4,000 kids to, to camp. Half of those kids have made a first-time decision They've discovered the love of God because of a dream that somebody had that I was able to put one person together with another person. And God touched in a generation. There's over 1,500 kids in the East Valley that have heard this message that God loves them. That's a crazy vision. It should have failed. It, should have, it shouldn't have happened. But because God was there and because God uses people like you and people like me, do you think that will make an impact in the kingdom of God. 4,000 kids, thousands of kids reach, a generation of kids reach because somebody had a dream. We don't want any qualifications or any time frames before God touches you and gives you a purpose. Like, just be ready for this. God's going to give you a p purpose through this free gift. He wants you to be used by him. So let me close with these three simple statements. I, I want us to be a church that's stronger together, that our best days are ahead when you see yourself as, as being touched by God to minister in His name. So let me give you these three th statements that I pray for you, and I'm going to use this scripture. It says this, I pray that out of His glorious riches, that means God's willing to give you anything that you need to meet your purpose in life. Through His glorious riches, He will strengthen you with the power of His Spirit, and then you will be made complete with the fullness of life and the power of God that comes into you. The first thing you need to do is this. You need to receive God's love. And, and, and a lot of you know about God's love, but you haven't received it. It hasn't been appropriated into your life because you keep um, hitting this wall and pulling back and putting yourself down and focusing on the past of what's gone on and, 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 and your failed potential. There's, there's a room that needs to come into your life so that you could receive the unconditional love of God. And then Paul says this in the next line. He says, and I pray that you have the power to understand as God's people should how wide, how deep, how high, how deep is his love. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully then. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. Um, I had this older woman come to me and she was in tears and she, she met with me in our church lobby over here. And she comes to me and she, was, she says, I want to start a church plant to reach the Korean community. 
But she said, we have no place to meet. Will you help us? And nine years ago, we were able to help start a church, a pilgrim church, a Korean fellowship that meets right here. She had a dream, and our church was able to help her fulfill that, that, that mission. I, I had a, a, a person come into our church on staff, uh, Joe Diaz, our worship leader, and he, he had been here for about a year, and he says, Pastor, my wife and I just feel God's calling us to have a ministry here, a Spanish ministry. Do you think we could start a Spanish ministry? What he didn't know is I'd been praying for 15 years to start a Spanish ministry, and I said, of course, let's start a Spanish ministry. And three years ago, we started a Spanish ministry, a worship service that has over 150 people meeting every Sunday evening, making an impact, a mission, inroad into our community. And then about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I had another friend come to me and says, I, I, I want to start a, a, a Masonic ministry in our community. He says, can we rent your facility? And I said, there's no way you can rent our facility, but you can do ministry with us. If you want to do a cornerstone outreach mission to the Masonic, to the, to, the, to the Jewish community, and tell them about the, 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 the Messiah, Yahshua, Jesus, we would love to be partnering in this ministry. And so we started another ministry. And, and that's how God works. When God gives you a dream, when God plants something inside your soul, and He says, this is what God wants me to do, and the church comes around you and says, let's go do it together. That's ministry. And the pastor, I'm just here to lead you by the hand to help you do that so that you can do the ministry. And, and here's the second point. None of this can happen if you don't believe your love. And the second point is this. If you want God to make you better, then you have to know you're worth it. You have to start seeing yourself the way that God sees you. And I know you're looking at your past, and I know you're looking at all these things in your life, and, but God sees among all of those things, He sees the potential that's in you. If you begin to embrace the values of God inside of you, and you say, Pastor, how do you know that I'm valuable? And I know you're valuable by the amount God paid for you. You are worth the transaction that God paid for you. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus came to this earth and he put a price tag on every single person. And the price tag was his own blood. And, and he purchased you, he redeemed you so that you could live out your original design in your life. He bought you with himself by his life. And then he redeemed you to your original design. He says, come on. Let's do ministry together. Let's tell people about my endless love, my grace that fell in your life. Go tell that story to somebody else. The Bible says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, uh, but you are the ones chosen by God, a royal priesthood, a chosen to be his holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made in your life from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. And some of you are saying, well, I, I chose the Lord. You didn't pick the Lord. You are a chosen people. Receive his love. Know his, your worth. And I'm begging you to do this last thing, and I hope the church and the rest of this world depends on this one point, if you can fulfill this in your life, Cornerstone. We will do more and touch more and grow more if everybody fulfills their purpose. And dream big. Like, think big. Do something great for God's kingdom. And I want to close with this last verse. It's from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than what we can ask or imagine, and that's why we dream. Because God's going to do something more than you can imagine, more than you can dream. So, so dream big. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and the Christ throughout all the generations forever and ever. And the church said together a great big amen. Now, I want you to bow your heads with me if you would. Wherever you are, just put down the distractions. It's just you and God right now. And some of you are here this morning, and, and if you're honest, you view God with a distortion in your relationship with Him. Some of you are here, maybe uh, you're viewing this service this morning and, and you don't really know 
who God is. Maybe it wasn't your idea to, to tune into this, but God's touching your heart. Something inside of you is saying that God is real, drawing you to Him. And some of you are maybe very religious, but there's still an emptiness. In this COVID season, it seems like everything is upside down and you're just grasping for air and God saying, I love you and I have a purpose for you, even in this upside down season we're in. Or maybe some of you have actually drifted away from God. You're a Christian, but you've drifted away. And today you just need to come back to Him, to give Him your life. Some of you just need God today. And so this is what I want to do. I just want you to close your eyes wherever you are. Just tune out all the distractions. It's just you and God. And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, God is saying to you, I need, I need you to know that I love you. And in response, I want you to commit yourself to me, to distinguish yourself from me. Just pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for, 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 for seeing something in me, for, for, for forgiving me, for everything that you've done in my life to prepare me for this moment, to live my purpose out, Lord. I pray that you would use me and I raise my hand. Thank you for accepting me exactly how I am and loving me for who I am. Lord, prepare me for what you have in this next chapter. There are greater days ahead. And thank you for this church that makes me better. Lord, help me to dream big for your kingdom. I commit myself. I surrender myself. Say that word, surrender. I surrender myself for you. In Jesus' name. service. A couple announcements I want to share with you this morning. Uh, we have our food drive that's going on. Uh, if you come to the church or go on our website, you can pick up a box 
uh, in our church lobby, and it has a list of the things that uh, would go into that food box. We're partnering up with the newer door to feed those in uh, need of food. Uh, as Pastor Chris mentioned during the sermon, we have our growth class. Uh, that's coming up after the, ser- the second service at 1130. It'll be here in the cafe. Uh, and again, just like Pastor Chris mentioned, it's, it's, it's about learning about the church, learning about uh, what the ministry is and what your calling is and how you can serve and be part of that uh, body of Christ here at the church. Um, and then uh, you know, we mentioned it last week and then just want to reiterate it this week. Uh, next Sunday at 9 a.m., we're having our in-person tradition service. It will be held outside in the parking lot. Now, this service is for those people that are you know, just hungry and just feel the need to be in, in, in church, in, in community. Uh, we're going to have all the safety precautions. We're going to follow all the guidelines in regards to COVID and just being safe. But if you feel you need have the need uh, to be here at that church service again next Saturday, excuse me, next Sunday, the 15th at 9 a.m., you can re- you can reserve uh, your spot and just let us know that you'll be coming so we'll be prepared for that. Like always during this time, we take our offering. Uh, you can continue to do so in, in various ways. Go online and give through our cornerstonehome.org website page you can give through the church center app you can send it in via via mail regular courier you can stop by the office and drop that off again it's a pleasure to be able to to come together as we continue this stronger together campaign it's just a a blessing that we can be together regardless of the circumstances we're living again god bless you have a blessed sunday until next sunday